it is time for some blunt talk on the Russia-Ukraine war. There's been so much spinning and so much fiction spreading and saying things that we want to happen, ignoring what's actually happening on the ground. And it's been going on for a long time, of course. We talk about it a lot on this channel. But we're getting into what, what we used to call in the Army sometimes nut-cutting time. And it's time to really address some hard facts because there's probably some actions coming near that are going to be unable to be spun in in a certain sense, maybe similar to how the Afghan war finally came to an end. We spanned that one left and right until finally in August of 2021, the spin met reality and reality won. And I think we're heading towards a similar situation there. To try and pack this, we have the absolute cream of the crop, Colonel Douglas McGregor on today to talk about some of these things and and to really to kind of take the wheat from the shaft and kind of show you the reality from the spin and, and explain to you why things are the way they are. Uh, Doug, always great to have you on board. Former highly decorated combat vet, CEO of our country, our choice. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, too. But, uh, Doug, welcome back to the show. Happy to be here. Well, uh, let's just jump right into it. Uh, there's, uh, as there seems to be every weekend, there's, there's, there's more fiction running around from the, from the White House, from some of the Pentagon people. Uh, and it, definitely some of those leaders in Europe, as there seems to be this just continued unwillingness or inability, I don't know which it is, to acknowledge what's actually happening on the ground. And what's happening on the ground is that uh, since that failed offensive in 2023 that the Ukraine side had, uh, they they kind of held the line for a little while. And then that started going uh, to the West. And it's continuing on up to that point. Let me just real briefly show you. Uh, and show some of the viewers here uh, some of the things that we're talking about. Um, and you'll see that uh, everywhere you want to look, this is from the Institute for the Study of War. And, and all these areas of, of orange and yellow you see here represent where Russia has been moving to the west. And you see every map that you want to show. Some places it's more, some places it's less. But in every place, it continues to show Russian advances, advance after advance after advance, all along the entire line of contact. And as long as that is going to continue on, and really I think it's going to because there really isn't any rational reason why that's going to stop. All the fundamentals are decisively weighted in Russia's favor. So I know that map doesn't surprise you in the least. No, uh, although like a lot of people, I think uh, I'm a little surprised that the Russians have continued to move quite as slowly as they have and deliberately. I, I think that that is in part a function of Vladimir Putin's desire to reach a negotiated settlement with the West, which isn't going to happen. And secondly, I think he continues to worry about uh, losing his own soldiers in unnecessary operations. Remember that this was never contrary to popular belief, as you pointed out at the beginning, about conquering Ukraine. There's no interest in that at all. And in fact, Putin went into this war with the assumption that by demonstrating the seriousness of it to Moscow, that we would somehow or another come to our senses, abandon this nonsense about incorporating Ukraine into NATO, and negotiate a settlement which would provide for Ukraine's neutrality. At which point in time, I don't think the map would have changed all that much. Now that we've had so much killing and so much bad blood, over the last two years, I don't think there's going to be much of a negotiation at all. I think the Russians are ultimately going to draw the map they want. And I still think that will include Kharkov and Odessa. And we're seeing these sort of movements forward, but I think more of them have to do with positioning for advantage when the ground is once again firm. The ground is still very muddy. Uh, it doesn't support a lot of uh, tracked armored vehicle movement. So I think we're talking about a, a major offensive all up and down the line that will move west towards the river, uh, probably in mid-May, perhaps the beginning of May. It'll take that long, I'm told, to dry out because they've had so much snow and rain. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, really completely supporting that view uh, on the Military Summary Channel, one of the, one of the best daily updates of what's going on. Uh, there was some talk today about what Russia is doing beyond the front lines and onto those very areas you mentioned. 
According to different reports, uh, the Russians are planning to uh, establish complete blackout of a significant number of towns in Ukraine. For example, the Economist reported that it wants to make Ukraine's second city unlivable. So the uh, the Economist was talking about Kharkiv, but uh, if you ask my opinion, Kharkiv is not the only town that suffers the same problem. Kharkiv, Dnipro, Zaporozhye, Kivorok, Nikolaev, Odessa, all these towns in the very very near future will be cut off. Yeah, so he's he's seeming to say the same thing that you are there, that all these things along the line of contact, and there's basically five areas of, of creeping offensive that Russia has been steadily and methodically moving through, but they've also been simultaneously uh, what it looks like to be preparation of the battlefield in the, in the operational depth uh, to prepare those other areas for a, perhaps a larger operation, which many, uh, I think I saw earlier that the UK... Uh, uh, open source intelligence said they think that something coming is coming by May, the June timeframe, a major new strike. Well, back in 2023, we pointed out, I think in an earlier conversation, or I certainly did with several other people that the Russians had invested a great deal of resources in building up logistical support structures. They had extended rail lines, uh, expanded railheads, improved roads, all the things that you would do if you wanted to propel forces further west. They did this on the assumption that if nothing changed, they would eventually have to cross the Upper River. Now, it's not yet clear that there won't be any settlement. I, I think it's unlikely at the moment, but as we get closer to the election, I suppose anything is possible. The other thing is that if you look at the European leaders uh, they are all immensely unpopular in their countries. And I'm talking about the key ones, such as Schultz in Berlin, whose uh, unfavorability ratings or approval ratings are lower than Joe Biden's. And that's true also to a large extent for Macron and I think Sunak and others. I think the Europeans have soured on this thing. Now, the, the question for Russia is the following. They've got to do two things. They have to ultimately establish themselves on what they consider to be defensible terrain. That's what they want. Secondly, they really don't want to govern Ukrainians. In other words, where there are real Ukrainians, Ukrainians that speak, Ukrainians are culturally Ukrainians, consider themselves to be ethnically Ukrainian. Uh, they don't want to rule those people. They don't want to govern them. They would much prefer that they exist in their own state. The only thing they want to be certain of is that first of all, they're neutral not a member of the alliance, and then secondly, largely demilitarized to the point where certainly they pose no threat to Russia. In other words, if we go back several years now, uh, you know, as you know, I have been talking about the Austrian model almost from the beginning, from 2014. I think we're looking at something like that for whatever remains of Ukraine. But that's a tough, uh, that's a tough mission. Now, let's assume that uh, the worst case obtains. Uh, instead of saving the lives of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, particularly Ukrainian soldiers, uh, no effort is made to negotiate anything. And in fact, we continue to talk in the terms that Victoria Newland and others have, that we're going to work hard to turn Western Ukraine into some sort of Afghanistan. Well, at that point, uh, the Russians don't have much choice and they will go to the Polish border if they have to. They'll go into, right up to Moldova, to Transnistria and to the Romanian border. And I think we know they can do that. The notion that that's somehow or another unattainable is nonsense. They've already looked into mobilizing an additional 800,000 troops. So I, I hope that, you know, some, some degree of common sense will prevail. We should take this as an opportunity not only to end the conflict in Ukraine, but go back and revisit all the agreements that we were willing to discuss some time ago about conventional forces on the ground in Central and Eastern Europe. This business of uh, telling the Russians that they have to live in a state of perpetual readiness to fight us is as dumb as it is for us to tell our own people that they have to live in a state of perpetual readiness to fight the Russians. You know, but, the, the, the irony okay. is, though, Doug, that I, I think that's exactly what many in the West, at least among the elite, actually seek and what they desire. And I think that as evidence of that, you can see some of the things that they have been saying in just the last few days, even in light of all of those things you're saying, the, the battlefield realities, the strategic reality, the, the industrial reality, anything you want to look at that shows that what you're talking about, that Russia has the capacity, they definitely have the, the, the will to do it if they must, but they don't desire to, to try and turn that upside down. 
here are some of the things they've been saying. First of all, uh, this is no surprise at all from this part, uh, but what follows is a little bit more. Here's Zelensky a couple of days ago saying why it's so important that he still gets those ADA missiles. Є система ППО у світі, які можуть допомогти. Потрібна лише політична воля, щоб ці системи були передані Україні. Зараз Петріотам місце саме в Україні, щоб згодом не довелось їх застосовувати щонайменше по всьому східному флангу НАТО. So he keeps going back to this, yeah, if you don't, we don't stop them here, they're going to keep rolling over. It's not even that they're going to go into Western Ukraine, that they desire to go everywhere else. And he reinforced that a little bit further uh, in a different interview uh, yesterday. We must tell Congress that if Congress does not help Ukraine, Ukraine will lose the war. If Ukraine loses the war, other states will be attacked. And that's a fact. That's a fact, Doug. Is that a fact? Well, he should rephrase his remarks to say that Ukraine, uh, if, if we're smart, will survive the war. But Zelensky, I, Zelensky, and my friends will not. Uh, that's the truth, and, and that's really where we're headed. I remember listening to Lyndon Johnson back in the 1960s, which now tells everybody how old I am, <laughs> uh, talk about the fact that if we don't stop the uh, VC in Vietnam, the communists in Southeast Asia, we're going to be fighting them in, in the streets of Los Angeles. Then I remember hearing John Abizaid, who became the uh, four star in Iraq shortly after the 2003 campaign ended, tell everybody, well, if we don't fight them here, we're going to be fighting them at home in our own country. I mean, how many times do we have to listen to the same bullshit lie, frankly, uh, for Americans to wake up and smell the coffee? Clearly, uh, Zelensky has no incentive to wake up and smell what he's shoveling. He's <laughs> Life is on the line, and his friends are. They're done. I'm still surprised that uh, Spetsnaz and uh, uh, other Russian forces have not descended upon uh, Kiev in the middle of the night and eliminated him and his merry band once and for all. I, I've I, actually heard people su suggest that Russia doesn't want to take him out because uh, he could be potentially useful as opposed to somebody else coming in or turn him into a martyr, etc. I don't know whether that's the case or not. But what I do know is that... Uh, kind of channeling his his own lbj we had uh cameron in the uk uh add his two cents in what we face today is as simple as then we have a tyrant in europe who's trying to redraw borders by force and there are two choices you can appease that approach or you can confront that approach it is undoubtedly the right thing to confront it and that is what we're doing by giving ukraine such strong support you know, the, the part that, that always amazes me that it lays out of this, because like so many that have the West for decades now have lived on spin and they never have to explain anything. But especially now, they, they keep talking about we have to give them this support. Cameron went so far as to say that European heads of state should go to the U.S. to put pressure on the U.S. Speaker of the House to basically make him give this money with the belief or the insinuation that that would make a difference on the battlefield, that $60 billion somehow is going to turn the war around. And, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit to that. Uh, well, there's, no, there's no evidence for that. <clears throat> and regardless of whatever Cameron and other members of the sort of globalist, globalist ruling elite in the West say, there's no chance to turn this war around. But this will extend the fiction uh, another six months or so. In other words, as long as they can spend money to create the illusion that something good is happening on the ground in Ukraine that benefits the West and defends Ukraine, they're going to do it because they've got captive populations. I was talking to a gentleman this morning from the Netherlands, and he pointed out that they're so heavily censored, real truth about anything on the ground in Eastern Europe and Russia and Ukraine or anywhere else doesn't penetrate. People aren't hearing it. They know nothing about it. So they're far more uh, censored than we are here in the United States. But the outcome is that people like Cameron are believed by the masses because they hear nothing else. It's all shut down. Uh, it's very sad. It's very tragic. But And they keep flinging this word democracy around. And the only meaning that I can attach to the word democracy in this context is Lenin's meaning, which essentially is that the vanguard of the proletariat it makes all of the decisions that everyone else is obliged to conform or they'll be shot well they haven't started shooting us yet 
but they're certainly pressuring their own people, putting people in jail, shutting people down, ending their access to their funds and their banks and everything else in order to make sure that they can continue to maintain this fiction. Now, it's not going to work. We know that. It's not. It will fail miserably. All of these people are going to be swept away. The only thing that's different is that they're going to be swept away in, in something more than just an election. There's going to be real violence on the ground in Europe as more and more people come to the conclusion they've been lied to repeatedly. Their, their societies have been destroyed. Their industrial power is ruined. How much worse can it get? You know, we, we, they want to destroy <clears throat> the agricultural output in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is the most successful agricultural model in the world. They could probably feed half the world. You look at the size of the place, the numbers of people involved, it's astonishing. Ultimately, it has to be destroyed. They want to destroy agriculture in Germany, all over the place. At some point, people are going to wake up and say, this is nonsense, it's got to stop. And Russia is not the enemy. And Putin thus far has, has been successful because he has persisted in his demand from the Russian armed forces to move slowly and deliberately in order not to feed the fires of stupidity and, and fiction in the West. And well, I think he's done a pretty good job of that. It doesn't well, make a great deal of difference right now, but I think in the long run it will. Hey, let, let us hope, because the, the fiction has not even slowed down in Washington. In fact, it, it, even on top of what uh, Cameron said there, you had uh, the uh, uh, Secretary of State throw his two cents in again. And, and I just want to point out, this is this is in the aftermath of all of the disaster of two years, everything that's currently going on, moving towards Russia's favor, even though everyone understands now that this war started because we insisted on moving Ukraine into NATO and trying to push it up to the Russian border in the middle of their country. Now he still says this. Ukraine will become a member uh, of NATO. Uh, our purpose at the summit is to help build a bridge to that membership uh, and uh, to create a clear pathway for, uh, for Ukraine uh, moving forward. Uh, we will see, I think, in the summit uh, very strong support for Ukraine going forward and its relationship with uh, with NATO. Now, this would seem to me, Doug, to kind of defeat in, into your your concern in, for Europe itself is that the people are becoming detached from their leaders because they see these things make nonsense. And when when people when I hear Blinken say, "Sure, we're going," there's definitely going to join NATO, and all these people in Europe are going to agree to it. I mean, if the if the leaders do agree to that. Uh, and I'm sure you're not going to count Hungary and Slovakia in that group, but if the rest of them do, it seems like that would hasten the problems that you're talking about. Oh, well, probably will. <clears throat> it also will accelerate the ultimate disintegration of NATO as it becomes more and more obvious that it's an impotent structure. It's a burden on an asset. It's a magnet for trouble. It's not a, it's not a creator of security. So I think, I think that's all going to happen. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this is sort of like 1967 in Vietnam when General William Westmoreland and uh, McNamara and everyone else that LBJ could put on the mission traveled all across the United States to tell everyone that we've turned the corner in Vietnam. Then we were hit with Tet in January of 1968, and suddenly the American people said, well, that's ridiculous. And uh, support for the war tanked. Yeah. And LBJ made it clear he wasn't going to run for re-election. I mean, it was a profound change. It was a huge turning point. I see something like that happening the closer we get to the fall. I think that's going to happen to, to Biden. Biden's not going to run again. I think he's going to resign beforehand, probably try to position somebody else uh, to run in his place. But th the point is, you, you can lie only so long, so successfully, and eventually it collapses. Look, even George Galloway, manage to get elected, go to parliament, and he's a permanent thorn in the side of the establishment because he's going to stand up and tell the truth. The truth isn't very popular. Facts are very, very unpleasant things for politicians, which is why they don't usually discuss them. So <clears throat> I think it's over. Uh, it's a matter of uh, when, will the, when will the complaining and the crying all cease? Yeah, and, and what is going to be the wreckage in the fallout? Because the... the, the anguishing part of all that is that it, it is entirely foreseeable but instead of acknowledging this and saying all right let's mitigate the damage 
maintain our positions of, of authority and power, which the West could do, which NATO could do, which the U S could do, they could still bring this to an end and still keep, you know, all the fiction for NATO going a lot longer. Instead, they're going the exact worst position, which I think it had carries, as you say, a very real possibility of laying the seeds and the foundation for the, the crumbling of NATO at all, because I, I, it was a great phrase you used there. It's a, it's a trouble magnet, not a creator of security. And that's, that's one of the biggest problems. Uh, I, I want to go into a, a little bit different direction here in the latter part of this, uh, because I, I want to kind of, paint the picture for, for maybe somebody who's not a military expert to be able to understand why you are so confident that the Russians are going to win in the, in the, the, uh, the Ukraine and its allies are not going to. And one of the confusions that a lot of people have is they see this front line, you know, inching forward a little bit to the West. Yeah. They see the Russians are moving in that direction, but it's not any big arrow movements, which people call like, you know, the thunder run in, in 2003 that the U S did, or, or even our blitz through the desert in 1991 in, in, in Kuwait. And people say, well, since they didn't do that, they must not be very good. But I think that the issue is, or a lot, a lot of it is that they don't understand what Russia is actually doing. Cause they're not trying to do what we did. Well, there's several things to consider. First of all, <clears throat> the Ukrainians, we're in a tough position from the beginning because they were trying to build a military establishment from scratch. Uh, they really hadn't been very successful, and it started in earnest in 2014. It never had much chance for long-term success because it takes decades uh, as a minimum for military establishments to grow into something effective and meaningful. Russia, on the other hand, had had a very different experience after the collapse in 1992-93. Uh, the Russians have a long martial history, a very successful one. I mean, they've had their share of defeats, let there be no bones about it. But nevertheless, they're still, they still have a very strong cultural foundation for military power. And inside Russia itself, uh, they began rebuilding, albeit very slowly. And it accelerated under President Putin because he realized that the army in every country is really an incredibly important institution because it's the repository of national identity, national values, national pride, and the army is the last line of defense for the people in the state. So he had to rebuild it. He began working on it. It had some tough times, some false starts. He had to purge it of the old Soviet elites, although not entirely, but for the most part, and put it on a different track. That track was difficult because technology was racing ahead at high speed. People weren't really sure what the future would look like. Well, now I think we have a much better picture, certainly if you're a Russian, of what the future looks like. And it means that instead of the sort of large mass forces that were used during the Second World War, the kinds of large formations that our military establishment is trying to rebuild stupidly, the Russians looked at uh, the battlefield and said, no, we need a force that can operate from a state of dispersion uh, and move as needed, but not until they are effectively protected by air and missile defense and to move only to those points that are of any real value. And again, here, there's something else. The Russians have an advantage over us. They understand that ground per se has no value. Ground is only important if it provides you with a tactical operational advantage. For people in the audience, that means that there's some reason to hold on to it because it helps you to be stronger or it positions you to go forward or it helps you stop someone from moving into it. That's yeah. as simplistic as I can put it. But ground otherwise doesn't really mean very much. There's vast spaces in, in Russia and Ukraine that in and of themselves have no military value. So the notion that they were gonna rush out there to hold ground, which is the ultimate expression of stupidity we hear all the time in the West, was, was simply not something that they comprehend. They, they don't think in those terms. So once they had moved forward and secured what was for them truly important, the Donets or the Donbass, and the population there, which was overwhelmingly Russian, that was enough. And then they saw the need to build up because they recognized that the force they would need in the future would have to be larger, but it would have to be organized differently. I mean, I've watched as Russian brigade size headquarters and a brigade in Russia varies, obviously, 
in size from three to five to six to seven thousand, depending on the on the purpose of the mission. But I watched as they rotated what we would call battalion size elements, uh, rotate these through uh, positions on the battlefield under brigade commands. They would use that battalion constantly in action for some period. Sometimes it was 48, 72, 96 hours a week. Then it would be replaced by fresh battalions, but the same headquarters above it uh, would remain in place. They did not treat their formations as unbreakable pieces. Yeah. They called them as Legos that could be hitched together as needed for the mission. And then they developed procedures, ways of doing business that linked the overhead and uh, ground-based reconnaissance, surveillance, and intelligence to the various strike systems. All of these would have to be put in place very methodically before any attack or offensive operation was conducted, or for that matter, any defensive operation was conducted. And, and it's so ironic, Doug, because someone wrote that in 1997. All the things you just said and all the things that Russia has figured out here in, in late and the, the West still hasn't. You wrote the book on this in 1997, Breaking the Phalanx, and it's just unfortunate that so few people that have any intelligence and vision uh, actually uh, clung to that because, man, so, some of this stuff – we're way behind on this. I think that I don't think you disagree that the U S military is way behind what the Russians are doing right now and what we should have been doing a long time ago. Well, you look at our Naval forces and you have a similar problem at sea. People are insistent on building these large capital ships like aircraft carriers. And when someone points out that it may not make sense to refuel two aircraft carriers with nuclear fuel, that are coming up for refuel, which is an expensive proposition that we may want to put our money elsewhere. Oh, we'll lose the next war without aircraft carriers. I mean, it, it's, it's worse than the battleship problem because technology is raised so far ahead. Now it should be obvious that yes. just as you and I used to talk about years ago, the empty battlefield, in other words, you end up with fewer and fewer forces exposed to the enemy over time because technology becomes more and more lethal. So you have to change the way you organize and to change the way you command. Well, the same thing is true at sea, only the, the ocean is emptying, at least on the surface. And at the same time, we're allowing our submarine fleet to diminish in size and striking power when our submarine fleet should be larger. Yeah. And the opportunity to build more submersibles that are manned or unmanned uh, is, is being ignored. I, I don't understand it. But again, you have this fascination with what I call the midway Jutland construct. Every admiral wants to stand on the bridge, pull up his binoculars, look out there and see this grand fleet. But those days are over and over. the grand fleet will go down quickly if we're not if we're not smart. The same thing is true for the people that want to build large army divisions and then cluster them in, uh, in, in concentrations on lines as we saw them in the bulge. And yeah. the Russians would simply eat those for breakfast. They would and, just annihilate them. And, you, you know, there's there's some some actually recent in, uh, uh, evidence on this. Uh, some new piece that came out, some more scholarship by Alex Vershin, a retired lieutenant colonel who himself is, a, is an armor guy, uh, kind of like we were. He just wrote this in the, in the RUSI, Royal United Services Institute, The Attritional Art of War, Lessons from the Russia-Ukraine War. And a couple of things he says in here, which is very similar to what you just said, uh, one of the things he wrote is that the attritional wars require an art of war of their own and are fought with force centric approach, unlike wars of maneuver, which are terrain focused. Again, that's what you had mentioned. They are rooted in massive industrial capacity in, in, to enable the replacement of losses, geographical depth, and absorb a series of defeats and technological conditions that prevent rapid ground movement. In, in attritional wars, Military objectives are shaped by the state's ability to replace losses and generate new formations, not tactical and operational maneuvers. The side that accepts the attritional nature of war and focuses on destroying the enemy forces rather than gaining terrain is most likely to win. Now, that does fly in the face, Doug, of, of the belief that it's no, we want to go and take their capital and they they want to go and take this place or that place. And if they don't take this city, then that means they're winning. But I know you've been telling me almost from the outset of this war for two years now that Russia was never focused on gaining terrain as much as destroying the Ukrainian military. I don't think the Russians ever thought <clears throat> that the Ukrainians would be so stupid 
as to mask themselves and then impale themselves on Russian defenses. I mean, there's no doubt that they hoped the Ukrainians would do it, but I think the Russians probably assumed that once the Ukrainians discovered that they would be destroyed if they did it, they would back off and they would look for a different way forward. You know, it's, some of our discussions about the Maginot Line, if the Maginot Line had been completed and run all the way up to the Belgian border and essentially sealing off Luxembourg and southern Belgium, which is the area we call the Ardennes, there wouldn't have been any uh, secret penetration and ultimate surprise attack all the way to the channel because the Maginot Line was actually very effective. And it would have taken weeks, if not months, for the Germans to penetrate it. There's something else here, though, that I think your audience needs to understand. Alex Verschinen is a brilliant man. If we were a truly professional army, he would be sitting as a major general in the Department of Defense in the Pentagon on the great general staff of the United States. And he would be working through all of these problems and issues and would be part of a group planning the future of the United States Army not uh, silly people who've never done or thought anything in their lives, but have, quote unquote, successfully commanded at every level of the U.S. <laughs> Army, right. which tells you absolutely nothing because successful command entails doing nothing but what your boss says, attending the country club gatherings, showing up to be part of the men's choir and all this crap. Uh, but and, we're not and, and I'm sorry, I got to throw in there how many of the guys who were responsible for the disaster of Afghanistan, especially in the last part, got promoted instead of like censured for their role in that. I mean, that's exactly what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, of course. But we have the same problem with modernization preside over a failure, and, and you will be rewarded for your performance because your principal job is to spend money. Money being spent is what Congress is all about. Congress spends money. If they spend money, their donors are happy, their constituents are happy. Whether or not anything they buy works is irrelevant. And you know, if you look at some of the things that we invested in during the Vietnam War, they're incredible. In fact, I was reading last night, General Eisenhower, before he became president, used to talk all the time, and he did his president later about, it's just incredible the damage that Congress does to our readiness by insisting on things that make absolutely no sense. Well, he was right, and it continues today. But today, there is this unhealthy uh, relationship between the senior military leadership, Congress, and the defense community that allows this to happen. And everyone's quite content because the generals retire. They're rewarded for their bad policies, bad leadership, bad decisions with lots of money. And that's what you're talking about. All you have to do is go back to Afghanistan. You were on the future combat system. You saw the same thing. Indeed. I mean, any, any, you know, what, what did you do on the future combat system, Colonel? I did what I was told. What did you do, Brigadier General so-and-so? I did what I was told. Well, nothing came out of it. Well, I did what I was told. And, <laughs> okay, and, congratulations. Move up. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> on the hills, we don't care as long as the money's spent. We don't give a damn. Uh, I, you know, it, it's a terrible situation we're in, but we're reaching the end, if for no other reason, because every 100 days we add another trillion dollars to our national sovereign debt. Right. Um, and one other thing about this, uh, Alex piece, I, I want to get your view on there. Gary, if you could toss that back up. Uh, he wrote that the modern battlefield is an integrated system of systems, which includes various types of electronic warfare, three basic types of air defense, four types of artillery, countless aircraft types, strike and reconnaissance drones, constructions and sapper engineers, traditional infantry, armor formations, and above all, logistics. In practice, this means it is easier to mass fires than forces. Deep maneuver, which requires masses of combat power, is no longer possible because any massed force will be destroyed by indirect fires before it can achieve success in depth, which if Russia is paying attention to this, that's the reason why they don't want to do any of these big penetration moves, at least not yet, because they would then make themselves vulnerable. So if that's not what their objective, would we then expect to see continued of this sort of methodical across the front booth? Or is there the chance that the maybe the Ukraine army breaks at some point and then they exploit it? How would well, you see that playing well, out? I think the Ukrainian army is already in, in a state of collapse. These poor people, they have nothing with which to put up uh, a defense anymore. I mean, they're running out of everything and we can't possibly supply them with anything that's going to make any difference at this point. 
But I think to go back to something that, that Alex wrote, what we're seeing instead of these principal penetrations, in other words, the, the big arrow that, that points in one particular direction that becomes the focus, as he says, for massing forces, you're now seeing multiple smaller arrows all along the front that will move independently uh, to the extent that they will be able to conduct their own offensive on the tactical level but it will all have an operational purpose in other words you'll see 15 smaller arrows that represent mm. penetrations and advances instead of one or two and these will then be orchestrated by the way you know this this is an old russian practice that very few people are aware of if you go back and look at marshal suvorov uh, back in the late 1790s, he was very successful because he did precisely that with his own force. And he always had skirmishers out front whose job was to prevent the enemy from figuring out what he was doing. Uh, my point is that there really is nothing new under the world, you know, uh, under the sun in the world. But what we have today is a technological change that means that 15 to 17 uh, independent penetrations by formations within this broader ISR strike framework are now vital because if you try to do two large ones, which is what everyone in the West wants, on the assumption that you're going to go fast, deep, you're going to go out of business fast and you won't get anywhere. Which uh, is what we saw in 2023. That's right. exactly what happened. So I think, <clears throat> you know, again, you know, Alex is a brilliant man. Uh, he, he, as I said, in a real professional force, he'd be a two star. And his whole job for the rest of his life is to sit around and figure these things out. By the way, that's what Ogarkov did. And Ogarkov's descendants, in other words, the people on his general staff, have continued this practice. And uh, as a result, the Russians have maintained their lead in what I would call operational art. And I see no evidence of us catching up anytime soon. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's more discouraging or embarrassing because we have all the capacity in the world to do it. We, like I say again you've wrote the book on this a long time ago and it's you've got several other iterations that have come out since you have alex writing what he's writing all the knowledge and the information is there if we just had the leadership that could act on it but i think if you and i've talked that's probably not going to come until some sort of crash when you have some martial top come in and just like retire everybody 80 percent of the guys at the at the star level and start from scratch and then you can elevate some people like alex i think it's what it's going to take and since we know what it takes to get to the top, which is absolutely not demonstrated character, competence, or brains, uh, removing these people won't have the dilatory uh, or, or the, uh, what's the right word, uh, the deleterious effect that people worry about. Right. Uh, you know, and this was what Bonaparte figured out. And that's why he had marshals that started out as sergeants and ended up as marshals uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. We're going to find out the same thing, I'm afraid. We need a big overhaul militarily in the United States to deal with all these new realities. And I think it'll happen, but it's probably not going to happen soon enough for us to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody that knows what they're doing. And remember, what the Russians are doing is being watched very carefully around the world. And you're going to see people that are that will begin imitating them, and with good yeah. reason, because they're successful. And you want to be successful, and you want to be successful at very low loss rates. Right. And that's that's something else that uh, President Putin has insisted upon. And I think it's worked. Yep. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't seem to go down that path. But I'd like to maybe have you on on a future effort where we talk about what we could do if we had the the political will on the top to get there. But uh, for right now, we really appreciate all this stuff because it brings so much clarity to anybody who's willing to look at the truth about why things are the way they are and where they're heading here. Before I let you go, though, I want to ask uh, on, a, on a shift on a different subject here, because I think it's probably imminent that it's going to be an issue, and that is in the Middle East. Uh, so uh, Israel broke a taboo that uh, but all nations have been off, uh, following. You don't attack anybody's embassy, and they broke through that to kill what they considered a high-value target in the embassy. Now Iran is, is close to being ready to ret uh, retaliate, to respond in some way. It's a lot of debate about whether it's going to be something big, something splashy, or trying to thread a needle or something like that. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what you think some of the options that is that Iran might do and what Israel may do in response to that. Well, 
Iran is is got to got to take an action that will have to be serious enough that no one will question Iranian military power. In other words, it has to use capabilities that signal not only Iranian determination to defend itself and its interests, but also signal its strength. In other words, that they're a modern military power to be reckoned with. At the same time, they want to do something that is not so severe that it helps to justify or legitimate very suddenly the entry of the United States into war on Israel's side against them and, frankly, the rest of Islam. Uh, that's a tough needle to thread. Will, will they use drones? Will they use uh, uh, missiles? They have an enormous arsenal, obviously. They also are very adept at, uh, at operations in cyberspace. They have uh, the same access to high-resolution overhead surveillance and reconnaissance that we do. So there's no shortage of targets. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the question will be, after they do whatever it is that they're going to do, which I think will be strategically damaging to Israel in some way, uh, what do the Israelis do? And that that is the next question. It's bad enough that right. you know, the Israelis have done what they've done so far. But I think, again, from Israel's standpoint, if you don't do these things and you don't drag Iran in, you can't get us into the fight. And really, I think that's the objective to get us into the war. That's the only way uh, that they can possibly win. And they're now pulling out of uh, portions of Gaza to prepare for future operations. I don't think there's any evidence that you're going to get a solution out of Cairo and the talks that are there. At yeah. the same time, they're also repositioning more forces and capability northward for an attack on Hezbollah. And Hezbollah is the key. If you attack Hezbollah, that becomes a battle of annihilation for Hezbollah and for Israel. And that's where they're headed right now. And that's the key to bringing us in, because without our support, it's tough to see the Israelis winning that. And when I say support, I'm talking primarily air, missile, and naval power. Yeah, and and I and I just worry about it because that I, if if what you say is right, and that's what my instinct tells me that the reason why Israel struck this general in the embassy as opposed to on the way or on the way out, because obviously they were tracking him, so they knew where he was heading into. It, otherwise, they would have known where he was. So they chose to strike the most emotional target that would prompt a, a big response from is, uh, Iran. And of course, we've seen that the people are are livid. The Iranian people are livid. They've had these huge protests and, and mass protests and people are angry even those that don't like the regime are angry about it because their country was attacked uh that almost no matter what is uh, iran tries to do they may want to thread a needle but i fear that is israel's already declared whatever they do they're they're going to consider it escalatory and take some action so the question is going to be what will the u.s do will we be uh, will we allow ourselves to be sucked into a war if Iran, if Israel takes further action that draws us in, I, I mean, so far Biden won't even talk about withholding ammunition for, you know, killing lots of innocent people. I can't imagine that he would then say we're going to stop giving you stuff if you get into a war with Iran, which so many in the U.S. want, as you know. Well, with uh, Speaker Mike Johnson in charge, I'm confident that we will march uh, merrily into war with Iran. Well, and that's not encouraging. Essentially anything else that uh, the Israeli government and Mr. Netanyahu want us to do. Let's be frank. Uh, he's a wholly owned subsidiary of the lobby. And that's the fact. And he's not the Lone Ranger. And there are lots of people who foolishly believe they'll benefit from this. They're going back in their minds to 1991 or 2003, thinking that, well, if I'm a cheerleader for this, uh, when this is over, I'll benefit. I wouldn't want to be a cheerleader for this particular operation simply because it stands a, a very high probability of dragging Russia into the conflict and eventually Turkey and behind them China. Why? Because the thing you're likely to lose very quickly is access to the Straits of Hormuz. When you do that, that changes the complexion of everything because about 30% of the world's, world's oil and natural gas still transit those straits. What's that do to supply chains? What does that do to the global economy? We, we could spend the next hour looking at all the implications. You know, I saw actually earlier this morning, Doug, that the, uh, or maybe it was last night, that the Russians have bolstered their uh, presence on the Syrian side of the Golan Heights already. So they're, 
there is some movements. It's small numbers right now, but they are escalating that putting their troops in the middle, which is not not a, a you know a good thing. No, and they have naval power in the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. I'm sure there are Russian submarines trailing our submarines. Our submarines are trailing their submarines. Israeli submarines are being monitored by their submarines. And, you know, the whole global ISR complex is fixated on everything happening there. In the meantime, the Russians are going to settle accounts in Ukraine and, and bring that to an end on their terms. While we are mucking around in the Middle East in this very dangerous environment, that could become more than just a regional war, it could become global in a sense. And that mm -hmm. ought to be something that even Speaker Johnson should be interested in avoiding. We would certainly hope so. And then that's that's and I think that really highlights the in, in a certain sense, global issue of our problem is the arrogance, because we do. We believe it's 1991. It's still 1991 and we can do whatever we want. It's even 2003 and it's like Iraq. And well, they couldn't do anything, even if they wanted to. This is not those situation here. And it worries me is that they I don't know that they're intellectually aware it's not 1991. Well, they're, if they're listening to uh, people like Christine Warmuth, who is the uh, Secretary of the Army, tell them how great our guys and girls are doing in the Army, uh, then I suspect, no, they have no idea what the hell is really happening. Uh, like you say, though, we may all find out uh, whether we want to or not here coming up soon. Uh, right. Thanks ever so much for coming on today, Doug. It's always extremely enlightening. Uh, very grateful for your analysis on both of these two crucial issues for American national security. We're going to continue monitoring all those and look forward to having you back on to give us uh, updates as things continue to develop. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for, and we thank for you guys for coming on too. Remember, please like and subscribe to this channel. If you haven't already, this kind of stuff you have from Doug, you don't get in other places. And uh, we want to keep giving this to you. Make sure that you uh, share this with your friends because we are unintimidated and uncompromised in bringing you the truth, whether it's something you want to hear or not. And we will continue to hold people's feet to the fire and people accountable for some of the things that they're saying, especially these cheerleaders he was talking about. We're not going to let that go under the radar. People need to know that what they say does matter. Thank you for watching. And uh, we will be back on the next episode of Deep Dive tomorrow. See you then.